So good evening, everyone. I think that um, some folks might still be joining, but welcome back to day two of how to live well and thrive with Parkinson's disease. I hope for those of you that were able to join us yesterday that you enjoyed the discussions that we had. I know I did. Um, and we're looking forward to kind of really getting started and just jumping in today with our next topic. So we're a little bit behind on our agenda, but not to worry, we're gonna make up for it well because we had built in a little bit of extra time just for this purpose. So we're going to be starting with um, finishing out that section about addressing care needs for a person with Parkinson's disease and discussing motor symptoms from both a physical therapist and neurologist perspective. So Dr. Quinn will start and then following, we'll go into the next sections where we'll hear from a person with Parkinson's disease, Mr. Smith, as he shares a narrative that he wrote about his journey with Parkinson's, and then move into a discussion about non-motor symptoms before our first break at 7.10. So hang in there. We have about an hour to go, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let it, uh, sorry, excuse me, I'll pass the torch to Dr. Quinn. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. I am really uh, excited to share with you just a brief presentation about physical therapy and a bit about the role of the physical therapist in people with Parkinson's disease. I'd like to start with thinking about kind of the overall picture of the rehabilitation team. And if you were on yesterday, you heard from Dr. Michelle Trochet and Dr. Katrina Long about the role of the speech language um, therapist and an occupational therapist. And physical therapy is um, another uh, service within rehabilitation. And uh, in, in most centers and certainly in our center, PT and OT and speech uh, work really closely together. And this is a um, model that I just wanted to share with you that's actually a relatively new model. The concept of multidisciplinary, meaning that there's multiple disciplines and it's not just rehabilitation and you're gonna be hearing from a lot of those professionals today. But the concept of multidisciplinary therapy um, is really so essential to successful management of people with Parkinson's disease. And I know yesterday there was a lot of discussion about you know, PT and OT and, um, and, and the benefits that people have seen from that. But one of the things I wanted to emphasize and the concept that's relatively new is this concept of consultative or proactive rehabilitation. And you can see that in sort of the, the top right-hand corner of that pie, where typically or traditionally I should say physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy were provided uh, more when people got into the more of the middle or later stages of the disease when they were having difficulty walking or difficulty or having some falls and, and problems with um, transfers. But what we're really knowing now is that early intervention, working with individuals with Parkinson's disease from the earliest stages, really right from diagnosis or ideally prodromal, and that's that period before they're actually formally diagnosed, which is is challenging in PD, but the earlier really we have the intervention, uh, the better, and with the better we think the outcomes can be. And this is, I think, just something I really want to emphasize is that early intervention is so critical, but it, it might be more of a consultative um, methodology where you're not needing to see a PT, you know, twice a week, you know, for the, the duration of your life, but seeing a, pay, uh, a physical therapist or an occupational therapist or a speech therapist early on, something like one to four visits with, with kind of frequent um, checkups. And one of the ways we often think about this is sort of using the dental model, where you go to see your dentist every six months, we think it's important to see the rehabilitation team members, you know, roughly every six to 12 months, and, and certainly when there is a change. And then that might facilitate a need for a more intensive type of rehab, where you go in and you work really hard on some specific skills or activities, and that's what we call restorative rehabilitation. And then maybe at some point there might be a need for more skilled maintenance, um, which tends to happen a little bit later in the disease. So I just wanted to kind of give this as an overview of how people are really thinking about disease management and that rehabilitation professionals hopefully will be people, it might not always be the same person, but that can be with people with PD um, throughout their lives. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll be speaking about how to address motor symptoms from a physical therapist perspective. So uh, what does a physical therapist evaluation entail? How can we get one? 
what types of exercise? That's probably the most common question that I get. So I'm going to answer that question. Um, how can we address some of these difficult motor symptoms? And I'm going to be presenting two cases, one where an individual is relatively early in the disease and someone who's a little bit more advanced and is having a little bit of difficulty with balance and falls. Next slide, please. What is the role of the physical therapist in Parkinson's disease? Well, I like to think of it um, sort of threefold. So the first is evaluation and management of gait, balance, and mobility problems. Walking is certainly the number one problem that people come to see physical therapists for overall, and certainly that is true within Parkinson's disease. And I want to emphasize the evaluation piece in addition to the management piece, because getting a proper evaluation um, where a, a physical therapist really takes the time to measure your balance, to measure gait, to evaluate the specifics of walking mobility in a person with Parkinson's is, is really important. So that time to evaluate, as well as um, developing a comprehensive um, intervention or management plan. A big component of those management plans and the intervention is motor control exercises and what we call task specific training. And Dr. Trichet actually alluded to this um, yesterday when she was talking about speech therapy, task-specific training is simply practicing the task that you want to get better at, right? So if you are having difficulty coming from sit to stand, practicing that task with some cueing, with some strategies, with some uh, different uh, training mechanisms that can be guided by the physical therapist or the occupational therapist. And Katrina also gave a really good example of some task-specific practice um, and strategies that people can use in coming from sitting to standing. So that's a really a, a main component of management um, by physical therapists. And then the last, which I have to say is a relatively new area in physical therapy, believe it or not, um, is personalized prescription of physical activity and exercise. We've always prescribed exercise, but the emphasis on early management and using what we call behavior change interventions or things like motivational interviewing to really help individuals get involved in exercise, know what their community resources are, help them to overcome barriers. This has become a really popular and a really important area of physical therapy intervention. Next slide, please. So let's think about um, uh, case one, which is Mrs. C. She's an individual who lives with her husband and she works part-time as a special education teacher and was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's. And she hopes to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease through exercise. There has been so much research on the benefits of exercise in Parkinson's, literally hundreds of exercise of, of studies that have shown a wide range of different exercises from Tai Chi to boxing, to, to um, balance training, uh, to cycling, yoga, you name it, it really has been studied. And what we know is that many of these different types of exercises have benefits. They might have slightly different benefits and some might improve balance more and some might improve walking or strength, but they all have benefits. Um, so for this particular individual, one of the things that she's also noticed is that she's been walking more slowly and that she's not as strong as she used to be. And what would be the best exercises for her to do? One of the first things that I go to and that many therapists go to now are recently um, developed guidelines for exercise. And this is again, based on those hundreds of, of studies that have been done uh, that we know now what the best recommendations are for exercise. And they fall into four categories aerobic activity, strength training, balance, agility, and multitasking and stretching. So an ideal program for someone with Parkinson's disease, really almost at any stage of the disease is incorporating to some degree each of these components. And what do we mean by aerobic activity? Aerobic activity means um, getting your heart rate up, right? Breaking a sweat, getting into a certain percentage of a maximum heart rate where you really feel like your heart is pumping and you're working hard in activity. And we often call this moderate to vigorous intensity. And these are things like brisk walking, almost like up a hill or really fast walking, uh, things like running, cycling, swimming, um, elliptical trainers, those kinds of things. 
Strength training is where you're actually putting load or resistance that might be focused on speed or power um, to, to the muscles. And this could be typically thought of with major muscle joints like your quadriceps or your biceps um, or your pectoral muscles and um, doing that repetitively two to three times a week for at least 30 minutes. So one of the ways that we think about that is some roughly 10 to 15 repetitions for each muscle group. I'm um, just getting back to the aerobic activity. The frequency that's recommended for that is at least three days a week for 30 minutes per session. Balance and agility is just what you really think of, of it. So doing balancing exercises that can be in all, you know, all different types, um, things like yoga, tai chi, dancing and boxing have those inherently built into them. And the idea with this is to perform this two to three time, um, days a week with daily integration as possible. Some things I tell my patients is, you know, if you're standing at the kitchen counter, practice standing on one leg or standing with a, a narrowed base of support. Um, so those are some really important components. And then the last is stretching, keeping our, um, our joints and our muscles um, and our connective tissue really flexible. Um, we often think about things like our hamstrings as being something that we would stretch but there's so many other muscles and, and, and joints that are particularly important in Parkinson's disease. And one of those is the, the whole sort of trunk area and the upper body, because um, oftentimes people can develop somewhat of a flexed posture and doing some stretching exercises um, to counteract that would be really important. Um, here, could you just go to the next? Um, yeah, so Mrs. C reports having some apathy and difficulty getting motivated to exercise. So we can tell Mrs. C, these are all the exercises you should do. And let's think about what would be some things that you'd want to do. But it's really difficult for a lot of people to get motivated to exercise. And apathy is another really common symptom that we see. So some strategies to help improve apathy are setting schedules. Um, so having really working really specifically on on Monday at eight o'clock or at 10 o'clock, I am going to do this exercise. And on Tuesday at this time, I'm going to do this, posting it and tracking it, even if it's up on a refrigerator wall, or if you want to be fancy, you can get a, you know, Fitbit or some sort of wearable device or use your calendar, but really tracking it and um, and, and scheduling it. And then the other thing that I think is really important to help overcome apathy is to have someone, um, you know, either socially that you work out with that you do the exercises with, or someone who is just a buddy who can maybe give a little bit of a nudge or a reminder, someone who you have accountability to, and that can really help to overcome some of the apathy. Um, and then the last thing I would just say is trying to identify what the barriers are. One of the really simple things that oftentimes people have is like, I don't know where to exercise. I don't know what to do. Prioritize having a space in your home, as small as it even is, where a yoga mat is out, or you have room for a stationary bike, or you put your, um, you know, you have a place where you might put, put a phone or a computer where you're going to do an exercise video. And then it's there, it's a reminder, and it makes it easier for you to actually do the exercise. Um, okay, uh, on to the next case. So case two is Mr. G and he is retired. He lives with his wife in New York City. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease 10 years ago. And he's had two falls in the last three months while moving from his living room to the bathroom. His wife and his daughter are concerned about his balance and think he should use a cane or walker. So how can his care partners help him uh, with transfers and assisting mobilities and preventing falls? So one of the best ways to help with preventing falls is um, structuring the environment looking through the home and seeing if there are things in the environment that might be contributing to that. Um, is there some, um, uh, is the, the lighting poor? Are there throw rugs that might be contributing? Is there a lot of clutter in the home? And this can be something that can be individually done or an occupational therapist or a physical therapist can come into the home to help evaluate what's called a home safety evaluation. That's probably one of the number one things to do. The second is to evaluate the task. So this is a very specific movement, getting up 
coming from a sitting to a standing position and walking into the bathroom, watching the individual do that and seeing where that task might be breaking down to see if we can help strategize as to why, um, why they're falling during that specific task. Um, it might require um, specific exercises then that could help or what we call sort of compensatory or assistive types of devices to help. And so if we could go to um, item two, what strategies can be employed to help Mr. G decrease his risk for future falls? So um, using things like assistive devices, such as uh, the walker that is shown here, this is called a USEP walker. This one has um, a laser light, which can be useful for people who exhibit freezing of gait, that difficulty getting started. And again, Katrina talked about that yesterday with, um, with regards to different strategies for helping with freezing of gait. But walkers like this can be really helpful um, they can help facilitate that forward motion and that getting started, which is sometimes difficult. They can provide additional support, right? So if we're holding on to something, just like shopping and you have a grocery cart, your balance is better because you don't have two points of stability, you now have four points of stability. And um, a, a, a sort of a step uh, above, a, a sort of a less invasive um, approach might be walking sticks. So some of the difficulties with walking sticks is it's really difficult to carry or have anything else, you'd have to almost use a backpack, but walking sticks can also provide that increased balance and support uh, for people going out for walks and things like that. And next slide, next um, item, yep. And uh, so what is the best type of assistive device? So I just kind of went through that and I just wanna talk about um, the balance exercises as well. So um, you can see this individual here is standing and practicing balance. Um, that is one of the best ways to actually improve your balance is to challenge it and to challenge it on a regular basis. It's very difficult sometimes for people to think about doing this independently, um, but this is an example of, of um, actually this is Chelsea's dad who is modeling this for us, um, where he's standing on it, what's called a compliant or an uneven surface, makes it difficult to, to stand, but also in um, a hallway where he can use the, the walls on either side to help balance in case he loses his balance. Obviously it would be useful to have somebody, um, could, could be useful to have somebody there to support, you know, to guard an individual, but there are definitely ways in the home that you can practice um, different balance exercises and challenge your balance on a regular basis. And that can be really helpful in preventing falls. Okay, next slide. So what can I do now? Review the exercise guidelines that I just um, went over and try to meet those weekly requirements. I think if you remember anything from this, I would say that probably the most important thing with the highest level of evidence is trying to get some aerobic exercise three times a week for 20 to 30 minutes. And certainly if you are not doing this now, really important to work very slowly into that. And I would certainly recommend um, seeing a physical therapist who could help guide you uh, on developing that program. Remain engaged in physical activities that you enjoy. Uh, many people say this when they say, you know, what's the best exercise to do? And it's the one that you will do. So whatever it is that you're excited about, that you have interest in, and that you will keep doing is important. There's many PD specific programs in the community, and I would encourage people to investigate those. And we have a lot of those resources available on our website. Um, consider several different exercises, right? There's no one perfect exercise. You know, if you don't like dancing, don't take a dance class, you know, but if you do, that could be something great, but maybe think also about some other possible ways that you can get other aspects. So dancing is great for aerobics, but maybe something else that's going to make sure that you're going to get strengthening in. Um, setting up a weekly exercise schedule and tracking your progress like I went through. Um, I think an important concept is moving more and sitting less. Again, if you can just remember that, that you don't wanna be sedentary or sitting for too long, making sure you get up, take frequent walks throughout the day. I, we do often recommend that people use wearable devices because they can track those, but most smartphones can also do that. If you carry your smartphone, you can get your um, steps, which is a very, rough indicator of how much you're moving and it can be really helpful. So minimize that amount of time sitting and go, going for uh, short walks throughout the day. Think about the best time of day to exercise. Oftentimes this might be um, a little bit later in the morning, not very early in the morning, but really consider the medication effects and when uh, you might be fatigued or not. 
Identify functional skills or activities that you're having difficulty with and practice those. Engage in task specific practice. And again, having advice from a therapist to help with that. And also understanding what might be limiting that. Is it fatigue? Is it flexibility, strength, or balance? Try to identify what problems might be affecting your ability to accomplish a task that you want to. And of course, it's really important to consult with a physical therapist who's a neurological clinical specialist or has experience in working with Parkinson's disease or other neurological diseases. Um, that is really important. And you can often talk to your neurologist who will help find a therapist who's right for you. Okay, so thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much, Lori. That was awesome. It was always really helpful because I know one of the biggest concerns my patients and their care partners have is how do we improve mobility and prevent falls? So um, I'm gonna give you kind of an overview of how as a neurologist, we address motor symptoms. Um, I want to be sure that I make it clear that it's really critical that each person's care is really individually tailored. So just because I mention a type of treatment, a medication or an option, and if you or your loved one is not getting that treatment, that does not mean that you're not being cared for properly. It may be that there's a reason that you cannot get that treatment or that it's not appropriate for you now, but it may be appropriate in the future. So just to keep that in mind. So first though, before we even get to treatment, I wanted to take a moment to just think about, you know, once someone's diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, that diagnosis has been made, what's next? I think sometimes we often jump to what's the medication or referral to physical therapy, but I do think we need to take a moment to digest what it means for the person with Parkinson's as well as their family and loved ones. So the it's, hello, can you hear me? Okay, um, I just heard a weird click. Um, so the person with Parkinson's, once they get this diagnosis, they may experience some stages of grief. So particularly at that early visit, when the care partner might be there with the patient, I would just remind the care partner that you're, it's really critical that your eyes and ears are open because the person with Parkinson's may have heard the words Parkinson's disease and then shut down and they're not hearing anything else. So it's critical that you as the care partner, the allied health professionals are there to serve as part of the team and an additional set of eyes and ears. I want to emphasize this again, and I know Mr. Coley has said it a number of times, but I say it to my patients as well, that the diagnosis is not a death sentence, or it doesn't even mean that someone's life expectancy has changed. We see people live a long, healthy, productive, and joy-filled life with Parkinson's, just as we saw with Margie's story. So I think that's important for us to keep in mind that there are things that we can do to continue to live and thrive with this disease. And with that, in terms of what are these solutions, we have to think holistically that there are both, there are mental, physical, and spiritual solutions. So that it's not just about taking a medication or going to see your doctor, but it's about incorporating all of these other strategies that we've been touching on. There's many options. So it's also important for the person with Parkinson's to identify their priorities and their fears so that those are addressed during the visits. And as a care partner um, or someone who's around the person with Parkinson's, you may facilitate that identification. Even the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, I know they've they serve in a big function that often the person with Parkinson's might be telling them what some of the challenges are. And it's important to recognize that part of the responsibility of all of us around the person with Parkinson's is to empower them to then bring those to the forefront so they can be addressed. So just a reminder that care partners have a critical role as another set of ears as an advocate. So don't forget about that, but you also need to keep in mind your own self-care because we know that care partners are under a lot of stress and that this, there's a lot of competing issues you have to think about. So all of that is said with through the lens of remembering your self-care. So any provider that's listening here today or that as a person with Parkinson's, you should remind your providers that they can ask you, you've now gotten a diagnosis. What are you thinking now? What are your fears? What are your concerns? What are your goals before launching into a discussion of medications or other treatment options? So 
That being said, I did want to touch on what the medications are, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive review of medications because I can tell you Parkinson's disease and its medication management is one of the most complicated illnesses, I think, um, because the medicines themselves are complex, the side effects profiles potentially, but just identifying the right treatment. So these are the seven broad categories of types of medicines that we can use to address the symptoms of Parkinson's. Levodopa is our kind of most powerful medicine. Dopamine agonists, I think of those as kind of a lock and key. So if you're trying to turn on the dopamine system, you use a key and that's what a dopamine agonist is. MAOB and COMT inhibitors, these are two enzymes that chew up the amount of dopamine in your system. So when we inhibit those enzymes, when we block those enzymes, in effect, we're boosting the amount of dopamine. So that's what those two medicines do. Amantadine is one of the oldest medicines. It actually was initially developed as a flu medicine. And we don't know exactly how it works, but we think that it enhances the release of dopamine from neurons. It also acts on other receptors like NMDA and glutamate. Anticholinergics, um, these are a category of medicines which are essentially muscle relaxants. They can be helpful for tremor and stiffness. And the newest um, kid on the block is adenosine A2 antagonist, um, estradefinil. This is a medicine that was most recently um, approved by the FDA to address wearing off. So these are the broad categories of medicines that are available. And we have a little bit more detail, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but I just wanted to point out a few points about each of the medicines. So levodopa comes in a few different flavors, immediate release, which works quickly, and extended release. We use that sometimes when someone's having overnight symptoms or we're trying to address wearing off. Um, there's some myths out there and levodopaphobia. People say that, you know, levodopa loses its effect over time. And that's why I don't want to start it and, and I want to delay treatment. So as we've discussed before, Parkinson's is a progressive disorder. So it means that the disease is changing and that means we have to adjust the medicines. So it may mean that the levodopa has to be increased or the frequency of medicines. Maybe you start out with three times a day and then it increases to four times a day. It's not because the medicine isn't working, it's because the disease is progressing. And this medicine isn't great for improving some symptoms like swallowing and memory. Dopamine agonists are like that lock and key. And some of them come as an injection form, a patch form, a pill form. Um, it's important to know that the patch kind of bypasses the gut um, and that can cause skin irritation. But what I would like to highlight is though dopamine agonists do have an important place and are used for symptom, um, treating symptoms, there's an important side effect that's a lot, often not talked about. That's impulse control issues. This drug can lead to gambling, sex addictions, craving sweets and gaining weight, shopping. I've had patients who unfortunately, you know, got addicted to shopping online or became addicted to Facebook or um, unfortunately became gamblers. So it's important to recognize that could be a side effect of this medicine. It can also cause sleep attacks, meaning you fall asleep suddenly, which is really critical to know, especially for those of you of us that drive, because if it happens while you're driving, that's very dangerous. MALB inhibitors. Um, one thing I'll just mention is that it's important. These need to be stopped before surgery. COMT and MAO, uh, in, excuse me, COMT inhibitors are meant to prolong the action of levodopa. So they're good for people that have the up and downs, the wearing offs. Um, amantadine and anticholinergics both um, can cause a, uh, side effects, including dry mouth and constipation, as well as confusion and hallucinations. So both of these medicines tend to be better tolerated in younger patients. And then the newest cut on the block, Narayans or Istradefinil, that's a, it's an antihypertensive, but it's being used um, to try to address wearing off. And it's important to know that if someone is smoking, the dose needs to be adjusted. So I wanted to talk a little bit about one 
a, a couple of issues related to motor symptoms that change as the disease progresses. <clears throat> One is called wearing off. So Parkinson's has this very unique phenomenon where people experience ons and offs. When they take their medicines and they feel it working, some people, not all, feel that their movements have improved. And then they feel when the medicine wears off. So it's like a light switch. They feel on and they feel off. This is a little depiction from the Parkinson's Foundation of a model of this, where you take the medicine and the blue line represents the medicine as it's peaking and then it comes down and people feel that. Not everyone experiences this, what we call a short duration response. That's a complicated way to say not everyone experiences the wearing off. Some people take their medicines, they don't really feel a difference. After several weeks of taking the medicine, their symptoms improve. And if they were to stop their medicines, their symptoms would get worse, but they don't have that immediate response. And over time, this wearing off, this up and down, tends to get more and more fluctuating. And it's because the brain cells don't store dopamine as well. So we talked about, you know, imagining the dopamine in our brain like marbles that are being passed from one hand to the next. Imagine that initially in the disease, you can make a little cup and hold the marbles. But as the disease progresses, it's like your hand opens up and those marbles fall through. So the brain cells can't store the dopamine. So we are more dependent on each dose. And that produces this on and off. And as much as people's motor symptoms, like they become stiff or slow, can get worse, they can also have non-motor symptoms like anxiety, sweating, or abdominal discomfort that go along with this up and down. People also experience dyskinesia. A lot of people recognize dyskinesia because Michael J. Fox has these involuntary movements. They're wiggly movements that are a result of the medicine in combination with the disease. So if we gave this medicine to someone who doesn't have Parkinson's, they would not develop the abnormal movements. And if we take the medicines away from a person with Parkinson's, the abnormal movements go away. So that is a phenomenon of Parkinson's disease motor symptoms. And we have some tricks up our sleeve of how to address them. Now, sometimes when medications either aren't providing a sufficient med, uh, control of symptoms, we have a couple of what we call advanced treatments to address symptoms. And I just want you to be aware that these are exist. One is called deep brain stimulation. It's a brain surgery where someone makes a cut in the skull or skin, they make a hole in the skull and they put a wire into the brain and that generates a signal that overrides the abnormal signal that the brain is producing. This wire is kind of tracked underneath the skin and there's a battery pack that sits in the chest. This is all kind of invisible. So when someone has this procedure, you don't know it. And this procedure is helpful for tremor that's not, respond, that's not well controlled with medicine. The motor fluctuations are this on and off and the dyskinesia. It doesn't help other symptoms like memory or falls, and it can affect one's speech and language. A newer treatment, but it's relatively old now, is called Duopa or Levodopa intestinal gel. It's like an insulin pump, except it's a little um, tube that goes directly into the jejunum. It bypasses the stomach, and it's a continuous gel, just like an insulin pump gives you a little bit of insulin every day. I wanted to touch on self-management, which I think is really important. And I'm mindful of the time. I know that I'm going a little bit over, but I'll be quick with this. But I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, the person with Parkinson's has a role too. So as a care partner or as an allied health professional, it's our responsibility to remind the person with Parkinson's about all of these seven tasks that are so important to managing one's own sim symptoms. One is medication management, so taking medicines, but also monitoring for side effects. Second, leading a healthy lifestyle. That includes a healthy diet, physical activity, and exercise we've, we've heard is so important. Complementary approaches might be included, like meditation or acupuncture, and ensuring someone's getting adequate sleep. Self-monitoring, so taking notes, maybe using wearables, observing your daily life, recognizing the emotional or other impacts of your symptoms using psychological strategies that might be joining a support group, recognizing anxiety and depression, doing self-care, 
maintaining one's independence. So if someone is having trouble dressing, bathing, that's the reason we urge them to do occupational therapy because we want to identify aids to help them to remain independent, even if it takes them longer to do some of these tasks. Making sure one's engaged in hobbies and socialization. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that being isolated really does affect our physical and mental health and educating yourself. So, you know, getting knowledge and information, but it's important to look at good resources. So I hate it when my patients Google because there's a lot of bad stuff out there, but look at reliable information from places like the Parkinson's Foundation, American Parkinson's Disease Association, and the Michael J. Fox website, and of course your doctor and the rest of your team. So with that, um, you know, I think that for the interest of time, I'm going to skip the cases. We did get two questions and we'll be sure to address those later um, because it is going to come up. One question was about how does someone get maintenance physical therapy approved by Medicare? And I know that's something that Elizabeth is going to talk about uh, regarding overcoming challenges to access resources. So stay tuned. And how to deal with the frustration of taking care of someone with Parkinson's and the stress? Are there alternatives to taking prescription medications? So that's definitely something Something we can discuss when we talk about the perspectives um, of the care partner as well as how to be an empowered care partner after the break. So I'm going to leave those for now and I'm going to check and be sure Mr. Smith is with us. Um, so I'd like to welcome Mr. Kermit Smith. So he is one of my patients. Um, who I've gotten to know for the recent years. And he's really an inspiration, um, I think, to me in terms of his resilience. And I've learned a lot about the journey that his, he's had, you know, before Parkinson's disease at all and just in, in life in general. And so I look forward to him sharing his story with you in terms of how his journey has looked. But as we listen to his journey, I'd invite all the participants to think about, you know, what do you think are some challenges to living well and thriving with Parkinson's disease? And what might be some solutions? Because that's really what we're here for today is to think about solutions. So Mr. Smith, if you could turn on your video. There you are. I'm going to mute myself. Okay, here we go. Am, am I up? Yep, you are. Okay. <clears throat> so I have to take a moment to uh, thank Dr. Shaw for asking me to read my narratives. I really appreciate everything she has done for me. I appreciate all the help she has given me. And um, I'm going to read my narrative and hopefully it'll touch someone, it'll read someone. Living and Thriving with Parkinson's Disease by Kermit Smith. <clears throat> I liken living with Parkinson's disease to residing with an unwelcome guest. I make it quite clear even understandably rude at times. His presence is not is unwanted. Go away, leave me alone. I'm emphatic and always, occasionally even screaming. I don't like or want you. But nevertheless, the guest ignores my imploring and I take a full occupancy in my home and my body. Mr. Parkinson's disease moved in as if I am a long-term vacation residence because with each passing day, he becomes more comfortable residing in my once happy abode. This atrocious guest pays no rent, offers me no entertainment, nor amuses me or comforts me ever. He follows me to football practice, even sat with me when I watched the Super Bowl, invites himself to accompany me to the theater or a movie, but never. Not even once does he make me laugh or bring me a moment of joy. Some friend he is. No, I receive no benefits from his extended stay in my home. This, um, 
this most unwanted guest totally disrupts the fabric and rhythm of my life. And despite all of my dissent and anger, his credo is mi casa es su casa. Yes, I regard Mr. Parkinson's disease as an opportunistic, unsought guest who takes advantage of me when I'm experiencing a very low ebb in my life. Why did he move in? I had not placed a for rent sign on my front yard, nor was there an ad in the daily paper stating seeking a roommate. No, I had not placed no sign, any sign that said vacancy was then. Then again, was there a vacancy sign? I certainly had experienced vacancies in my life. I was the primary caregiver for my, for my mother and even moved into a home to better address her health and her spiritual needs. I happily settled into a routine with her and she became one of the primary folky in my life. Sadly, in 2014, she took her place among the ancestors, which was devastating, leaving me lost, even clinically depressed. In 2015, I retired after 41 years of continued employment. And though retiring was elated, it proved to be just another dramatic and disruptive force in my daily routine. Two vacancies. Life was different. So very different that I barely recognized my once lively, invigorating self. And then in walks my unwelcome guest. With his arrival, I began noticing that my gait was off, that my mental acuity at times was far. Stiffness robbed me of my strength and fatigue visited me more often than usual. My undesired guest was slowly revealing himself to me and seemed elated with his newfound residence. I sought help and guidance from my primary care physician who sent me to a neurologist. One fateful day, I heard him say, Mr. Smith, I think you are in the initial stages of Parkinson's disease. Me, Parkinson's disease? I thought the Parkinson's disease was a disease of prize fighters or football players and those who have suffered multiple concussions. Since I fit none of these categories, I needed to believe that the neurologist was most assuredly mistaken. My undesired guess was extending his stay and everyday life became more and more challenging in all spheres, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. I grew increasingly frustrated, but over the years, I accepted the complexities of my new, of my new life, and I realized that I was the 2015 new but not improved and updated version of Job from the Old Testament. God, as he had done with Job, told Satan to do whatever he desired to do with him, but just don't take my life. Parkinson's, like Satan, or perhaps better, the unknown is cunning, is baffling, and even insidious. It affected me mentally, physically, and spiritually. Mentally, it made me doubt myself. Physically, it played havoc with my body. Spiritually, it caused me to question my faith in God. And in the end, God revealed to me that Mr. Parkinson could not inhabit my body or my home without me and God having a say in the parameters of his stay. I could not go to tennis court and evict him because of his squatter's rights. I could not kick my guests to the curb, but I could have a say. Clearly, I discovered ways to make my guests less, less comfortable and me more at ease with his presence. My guest detested my introduction to a wonderful and competent neurologist. She considers me a partner in my care and assists me in the management of my medications and with navigating the complexities and perplexities of the healthcare system. Also met a psychiatrist who assisted me in regaining my strength and spirit to resume football coaching and traveling. They both helped me to understand that the mental aspects of Parkinson's disease the physical aspects were fairly easy for me because I believed in keeping my body in good condition. Therefore, going to the gym as they recommended was already my habit. Spiritually, I committed myself to God's care, 
and praying for the knowledge of his will for me and for me to have the integrity and the spirit to follow it. Prayer, meditation, and daily affirmations allow me the freedom of thought to begin aspects of my life I suspect that I have woefully expired and decomposed. God questioned me, even as he had done to Ezekiel, with the probing inquiry, Kermit, can these bones live? I asked him with a resounding yes. And once again, I traveled to Egypt. And for the first time, I toured Ethiopia. I resumed my football coaching career. I'm studying Egyptian hieroglyphic writing and keeping my mind and my body engaged through the practice of Tai Chi. Broadway Theater became my loss, but now my reacquired friend and my off excursions to view the best in film resumed. I was back. I am back. Day by day, I'm becoming spiritually healthier and stronger. Yes, the COVID-19 pandemic slowed down my return. But in the words of Dr. Maya Angelou, I rise, I rise, still, I rise. My guest is still here. I know it and he knows it. I have learned to thrive even in his presence and neither of us is going anywhere. Sometimes he demands his squatters rights, for many days, I'm the one who calls the shots. My guest and I will never become BFS, best friends forever. But we are learning to live with, understand, and respect one another. I am healthy. I am strong. I am disease-free. I am blessed by my ancestors. And I am surely blessed by God. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith, for sharing your story. I know that I've been moved by it, and I'm sure that many others today. So um, I think that your story perfectly highlights and is a great transition as well as we talk about that motor symptoms are not the only symptoms that affect someone with Parkinson's, but non-motor symptoms. And you touched on a few of them, including fatigue, but also the role of your mental health and spiritual health. And so with that, um, I thank you again for sharing your story. And I hope that this will serve as an inspiration to others who are experiencing challenges just as you had. So with that in mind, it's a hard act to follow, but <laughs> we'd like to kind of keep moving on um, and discuss what are the care needs of a person with Parkinson's from a non-motor perspective. So we'll be hearing about, you know, what these non-motor symptoms are, which may be some terminology that some are not familiar with. And so we'll review that, but we'll be hearing from Dr. Stephanie Asuris, who's a neuropsychologist, Dr. Benzi Kluger, who's a neurologist, but also a specialist in palliative care, a nutritionist, Ms. Shoshana Genick, and then I'll round out the conversation from my perspective. So without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Asuris. Hi there, thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. Can everyone hear me? Wonderful. Thank you again. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here and, and hear everyone's perspectives. I'm, I'm learning a lot myself, so thank you again. Um, so I'm just gonna speak a little bit about um, cognitive changes that, that we know can occur in Parkinson's disease. And so we'll address a, a little bit um, more about what that looks like, how to recognize these difficulties, um, how to go about evaluating cognitive changes, who should be evaluated and why, um, and maybe most importantly, the steps after an evaluation, um, which hopefully include ways to manage some cognitive uh, changes. Uh, next slide, please. I don't think I can do it. Next slide. Anyone? Yeah, I think Carol has to do it. Hold on. Oh, there, I think she's, yep, there we go. Okay, thank you so much. 
so this slide really just demonstrates that cognitive changes um, aren't uncommon, um, but can certainly vary in severity and time of onset throughout the disease course. Um, and here to the right, I've really just listed some of the most common complaints um, that, that these were actually provided by members of a, a cognitive strategies group that I, I lead, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, uh, but but some, some common complaints are things like forgetfulness or short-term memory problems, trouble coming up with a word, which can impact communication, difficulty expressing thoughts clearly and sort of maintaining a train of thought, concentration, difficulties, multitasking or keeping up with multiple conversations at once, some overall slowness um, of thinking. Uh, and if someone's experiencing these sort of changes and wants to better understand um, why and again, what to do about it, that's when a referral for a neuropsychological evaluation is, is usually done. Um, some things that we look at are whether or not these changes are related to, to Parkinson's disease uh, versus just changes that occur with normal aging. We know that cognition doesn't stay the same throughout our lives and it's hard to know exactly what the cause is. Um, it's hard to be objective um, uh, and to really know what's normal for, for aging. Um, also, an evaluation might be indicated if someone wants to understand se severity. So how, really how bad or not bad are, are these symptoms or are these changes, um, which can really guide a referral for certain types of supports that someone might, someone might need cognitively. Um, and then finally, if there's an, an intervention that's warranted. Um, I think, next slide. Great. Um, so at that point, when it's determined that there are some changes, I want to better understand them, um, uh, usually a neurologist, although other, other providers can, but typically a neurologist will refer for a neuropsychological evaluation. And I know other providers, I think Dr. Quinn was talking about it earlier, you know, talking about a good evaluation, uh, an appropriate evaluation is, is really critical in guiding treatment recommendations. So I, I just wanna walk you through sort of the practical steps of a neuropsychological evaluation. Oftentimes people aren't quite sure what, what that means. We just say, come for two to eight hours and we're gonna do some things. Um, but, but really, it, that's, a, that's a big range, but I can be a little bit more specific. So, so usually you should expect to be um, at, at this type of evaluation for maybe a little bit longer than your typical doctor's appointment. It can take, I would argue two to four at the absolute most. Um, I'm sp speaking sort of pre-COVID, although I will say we now do a lot of remote evaluations quite effectively, but just sort of the, the typical standard evaluation is done in person. As you can see in this picture here, it's usually done at a table. The examiner is on one side, uh, the patient is across um, the table. It starts with the, a clinical interview, which is I think very common for all of these types of evaluations. Um, we wanna understand the history, uh, in terms of symptoms and just your personal history, as well as other relevant factors. So we know a lot of things can impact cognition, obviously a disease process, a neurological process, but other things like sleep or mood changes, um, other medical conditions, vascular risk factors, all of these things can be can impact cognition. And, and that's relevant when we, again, are ultimately making uh, treatment recommendations. Um, and then after that 30 to 60 minute interview, um, there's about a one to three hours. I know that's quite a range. I would argue on average, it's about one and a half, two at the absolute most um, hours. Of, and that's a change. If someone's had a neuropsych evaluation years ago, they were much, much longer. We have, we have learned what's effective and we've learned how to streamline quite well now. Um, but the, the tests are usually paper, pencil, question, answer type tests. Each test is just a few minutes long, um, but we do many because we are measuring many areas of cognition. Um, we're looking at attention, problem solving, memory, language skills, visuospatial skills. Um, and, and so uh, some examples might be just repeating things after me, uh, drawing a picture, looking at a, a picture and completing a puzzle, making blocks look like a particular picture, drawing, uh, uh, drawing something, um, understanding definitions of words. Again, each test is usually just a few minutes long. Some of it, as you can see here, involve manipulating items. Oftentimes it's really just answering questions. Um, after those, that battery of tests is complete, um, we take the scores on the test and we compare it essentially to a database of individuals who, um, with sim similar demographic variables, so we can get a, a sense of whether or not those scores fall in a normal range. Um, in the same way that lab results, there may be a range of what's normal, um, but there's sort of statistical methods that we use. Uh, and, and then usually what happens is uh, about a week later, 
uh, individual returns, ideally with, with family um, or care partners to, to discuss what the results mean. So if we do see that there is a change, we want to, uh, our job is to identify certain patterns that are associated with different parts of the brain, different processes that we know um, to understand what's causing the change. That's, that's oftentimes the first goal. What's causing these cognitive changes if indeed we see a cognitive change? Um, and then we can identify the strengths as well. So, so yes, we're identifying some weaknesses, but also some strengths, which we'll utilize in treatment recommendations. Um, understanding then the severity or, or lack thereof of these cognitive changes, um, that's particularly critical when we're identifying areas that need support. So for example, if we really are seeing a trouble with short-term memory, we might make a recommendation that reminders for taking medications is going to be critical because we, we know where there might be a, this particular cognitive deficit. Um, whereas if we're just seeing slowing, maybe reminders aren't the most important recommendation. Um, as I mentioned before, it's, it's useful to know what's working quite well. Um, and that can be a focus of maintaining or even gaining certain independence or, or autonomy and confidence. I think sometimes when there are changes, oftentimes there's a, a, a response to sort of remove responsibilities for safety purposes. That might be indicated sometimes, and we'll make those recommendations when that's the case, but other times we're identifying areas that can really um, be used as a way to, to again, to increase um, sort of mastery and independence. Um, even if it requires monitoring, uh, I think that that can be a really useful outcome of, of our evaluation. Um, and as I said before, you know, we, we originally saying that we want to identify the, the cause. And if we find that the cause is something other than disease related, and it might be due to other factors such as a, a sleep or mood, we can then make recommendations based on that. Um, so once we make those recommendations that we discuss in that feedback session, uh, we sort of discuss that with the patient, provide the information to the, to the other team members. Um, but one specific recommendation that is carried out by the neuropsychologist can be cognitive remediation. So I think one difference with neuro neuropsych uh, evaluations is it has historically been a service just of assessment and diagnosis. And there's not a lot of neuropsychological treatment that has oftentimes been done by psycholog um, psychologists who, are, who specialize in rehabilitation and rehabilitation centers, and neuropsychologists have just provided an assessment. And I, and I think that's starting to change and I think that's for the better. Um, so, so I'll talk just briefly about cognitive remediation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and um, the, I think one of the biggest take homes with cognitive remediation treatment to, to, to understand it is that evidence-based treatment today is typically strategy-based rather than skills training. And, and what I mean by that is that the focus of treatment is learning compensatory strategies such as an external tool or even an internal uh, tool or strategy um, to help manage an area of cognition that isn't working quite as well, rather than practicing a skill. So a lot of times I'll have patients come and talk about, you know, playing a computer game or um, uh, getting better at a particular uh, puzzle or a, a game again on the computer. And, and although that, if it's enjoyable, that can certainly be engaging and positive, there's not a lot of evidence showing that that generalizes into real world improvement in cognition um, or, or real world improvement in functional ability. Uh, and so what we found, that the evidence has shown um, and many, many studies has shown that again, the most effective thing is having some guidance into developing strategies to help. Um, so, so for example, uh, a, a, you know, using a notebook, and I know that sounds um, simplistic or that sure, it's common sense to write things down. But oftentimes people believe that using a notebook or writing things down may weaken their memory. They're not practicing the act of remembering. They're relying on a, a, a crutch, I've heard patients say. Uh, and what we know, again, from evidence is that that's in, in fact not true. Uh, it does not weaken your memory at all. And that using that strategy is the most effective way to improve sort of your memory functioning. Uh, so, um, you know, the end result of learning these particular tools and strategies is to uh, allow your memory to, to function in a way, even if from a neurological basis, your memory isn't working quite as well as it was years before, um, in, a, in a functional way, it can allow you to achieve, again, more uh, improved functioning and increased independence 
uh, in your activities of daily living. Um, so a little bit more about, about treatment. Um, it can be cognitive remediation or cognitive strategies training can be individual or group. Um, uh, once the area or areas of cognition that, that need to be addressed have, are, are identified via that evaluation, um, the, the practitioner and the, the patient identifies the, which strategies are going to be most effective. And it is um, essentially presented in session, it's practiced in session, and I think most importantly, it's then taken home and used in the, the individual's real world. Um, and I think this was mentioned today too, you know, the, the next week, let's say the, the outcome is, is brought back to session and then you can really problem solve around what were the obstacles, um, what made it hard to implement and, and then sort of modify those strategies. Um, and, and I think that that's probably the most effective part of treatment that requires a practitioner. You know, you can learn about these strategies by reading a book and, and that's certainly helpful, but to really have someone um, that you're problem solving with about sort of managing the obstacles, figuring out what works for the individual, I find to be one of the most effective parts of, of, of treatment. And, you know, this type of treatment can last, I, I would argue, you know, an eight to 12 weeks, maybe that is the plan. And then um, oftentimes people return if they're needing sort of a, a reminder or improvement, a sort of brush up on these skills in the future. Um, sometimes psychotherapeutic techniques, sort of acceptance of, um, of changes, uh, what that means for your identity when you've experienced cognitive changes. So some psychotherapeutic skills can be integrated into this type of treatment. I often find in those cases, treatment might last a, a bit longer and that's, that's perfectly fine too. It, it, that, I think that's determined really by the, the patient and the, and the clinician. Um, next slide. So I just wanted to give a, a, another just brief example of um, of what we might do. This is actually from one of, this is a, a slide from one of the groups I run. I was just men mentioning individual treatment examples, but this can also be done in a group setting, which I think is also really helpful to, to have individuals share experiences with themselves. I find that to be something I never get out of individual treatment is just seeing the sharing of, of, of ideas and, and, and obstacles and come helping one another sort of determine ways to, to manage that. Um, but again, just an example. Uh, so we don't spend the session, again, practicing a, a skill in an abstract way, but on, with a game or anything like that, but really talking about practical things. So one um, of, the, of the exercises was thinking about having a, a location for um, important items so to help prevent misplacing of things. Um, so identifying a specific container in a specific location. Um, and again, although that sounds like something that, of course, that makes sense, it's surprising how often we find that that's not, it's not actually happening in your day-to-day -day life. So one of the most important things is um, having individuals report back how it's working. Why isn't it working? Um, and then if it is working, what does that mean? Are you searching for things less frequently? Are you less frustrated? How confident do you feel about knowing where things are? Um, so that's just a, 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 one of the examples of sort of the, the practical strategies that we, that we use. Um, I'll just give one quick kind of example, uh, case example, and then uh, I, I, we, can, we can move on. I don't wanna to take too much time, but um, so one individual who, who came to me with um, memory changes had an evaluation. It was determined that there was um, a, a weakness or a change greater than we would expect for age with the efficient learning of information and, and recalling later. So learning new information, short-term memory. Um, this was affecting things like memory of past conversations, um, which made it slightly harder for him to communicate with others because he was concerned about repeating himself. I, you know, I, I don't remember what we talked about. I might say it again. I've been told I've re repeated myself. So um, he was becoming more socially withdrawn. Um, so it was sort of impacting something more than just memory. Uh, it was I interfering with the relationships. Um, it was also uh, the memory changes were affecting prospective memory, so remembering to do things, so um, things in the future, like remembering that he had an appointment. Uh, and, and so once this was identified in, in the evaluation, he was referred for cognitive remediation. Um, and in treatment, so one step is first to find out what strategies are being used, right? Um, is something working, is something not? It was determined that uh, there hadn't been, although he had was writing things down, it wasn't in a consistent, consistent method 
uh, it wasn't in one place. It wasn't in an organized fashion. It was sort of random notes. Didn't know where to find them. And it wasn't in, again, in a method that was easy to use. And so that required some teaching in session um, and, and sort of a structured system. And practice, practice in session, practice out of session, um, both for to-do lists and items in a calendar. Um, and uh, although he was able to do that quite well, the next obstacle was great. I'm using, I'm creating this calendar, I'm writing things down, but I'm not looking at it. So great that I'm writing it down, but then I still forget what I have to do because I'm not reviewing it in any sort of regular way. So then there was an additional strategy of setting an alarm um, and creating a routine to review the calendar twice a day. So right after breakfast and then in the evening, right before bed. Um, so in this way, you have two opportunities to review what, what is going to happen. So this is really a, specifically addressing the perspective memory. Um, and what, what I really loved is that um, he added a strategy. He decided that at the end of the day, he was going to, in addition to just reviewing what, what, what had to be done the next day, he was going to review what, what he did do during that day and start to write how he felt about the activity, sort of his reaction to what happened. Um, and, you know, not only did that sort of add an emotional component that made some of the memories more salient in terms of what he did, but it served as a, a diary and he could then review back and have a little bit sort of richer description of how his time was spent and what he was doing, which also enhanced his, his, um, his retrospective memory. Um, and so this is just an example of how a cognitive, one very specific cognitive strategy can kind of evolve into something bigger uh, and how this kind of treatment might work for an individual with memory changes in Parkinson's disease. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Oh, You're muted, um, Dr. Shaw. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we could hear you, but there was just the echo. Do you want me to, mm, yeah, it might, I, I can go ahead and introduce. So I think next up is um, Dr. Benzi Kluger, who is gonna be um, addressing uh, non-motor symptoms as well from a palliative care perspective. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. And um, I'll address uh, some of these questions here. Uh, the, the first one, which there tends to be sometimes a bit of confusion on. If people have heard of palliative care, uh, very frequently they associate palliative care with hospice and with cancer. And so to kind of address these myths and take a step backwards, um, I'll start by defining palliative care and then talk about how it applies to Parkinson's. But palliative care, broadly speaking, is really just a way of saying person-centered care. So a way of taking care of, in the words of of our palliative care founder, Dr. Cicely Saunders, the total pain of a serious illness. And if you remember back to Kermit's story, um, you know, having Parkinson's, there's no doubt a physical component to it, uh, but the total pain of Parkinson's goes beyond that. It can be spiritually challenging. It can be emotionally challenging. It can affect us socially. Um, Parkinson's disease uh, is an illness that does not just affect one person. It affects a couple, it affects a family, sometimes it affects a community. And, and so putting all those things together, what palliative care is, it's an approach to the care of people living with serious illness uh, that aims to improve quality of life. And when I say people affected by serious illness, I mean both patients and their families by addressing the whole person meaning addressing spiritual challenges, emotional challenges, difficult symptoms, things like pain, depression, constipation, um, and also uh, some uh, social logistics and, and getting extra help. Um, 
One of the things that's also confusing about palliative care is that we use the same term to refer to two distinct things. So palliative care is an approach to care and palliative care is an approach that anybody on the healthcare team can take. And, and I would argue anyone on the healthcare team should take when they are caring for somebody with a serious illness like Parkinson's. Palliative care is also a medical specialty, sometimes called hospice and palliative medicine. And there are people who do extra training to become palliative care specialists. And those people may see more complex cases. They may see people who are really struggling with pain. They may see people who are nearing the end of their lives. And for people with Parkinson's disease, uh, to answer this next question, I think everybody merits a palliative care approach right from the time of diagnosis. And so taking on a palliative care perspective at the time of diagnosis means recognizing that people have a need uh, not just for information, but also potentially for emotional support, uh, potentially for a roadmap to help them to uh, get their bearing and find out what the road ahead looks like and help them to make plans. Um, it may mean giving them support and how to talk about Parkinson's with their friends or family. And then throughout the course of the illness, uh, there may be other palliative care needs that come up. Uh, for example, working with non-motor symptoms, uh, such as pain or depression, um, taking on life challenges, such as perhaps having difficulties being able to work, uh, needing to modulate or modify um, how you enjoy yourself or, or even uh, how you define yourself and, and wrestling with ideas of identity uh, when uh, this uninvited guest of Parkinson's disease uh, suddenly joins you. And certainly for people with advanced disease and for people who are nearing the end of their life, uh, palliative care becomes very important. And the palliative care approach at that point for a lot of people is really about how do I spend as much time as possible out of the hospital and with my family? Um, and that, that falls under uh, the term of hospice, uh, which in this country is designed for people who have on average six months or less to live. But yeah, people can live longer than that. Sometimes people do better on hospice. My record holder was on hospice for six years. I have seen people graduate from hospice. And sometimes that happens because when people are allowed to stay at home and avoid hospitals um, and focus on what's most important to them, they, they do better. Um, so palliative care can help in a number of ways. So palliative care can help with providing a roadmap and guidance to help plan for the future if that's important to you. Uh, palliative care can help with care partner and family support. Uh, palliative care can help with emotional support, uh, difficult symptoms that are sometimes hard to address or hard to find somebody who wants to address them like pain. Um, and also sometimes with uh, social support or, or getting extra help at home. Uh, so if we look at these um, two cases, so the first one, Miss S, who is a care partner to her mother, uh, she is the only care provider. She manages her mother's medications. She is working. Uh, she's overwhelmed. And, and what can we do to help support Miss S? So with a palliative care approach, uh, one thing I would say is that palliative care almost always involves a team. And so I, as a physician on the team, might work with Mrs. S to let her know more about what the future holds, more about what's most important, perhaps education on medications, um, we would likely have a social worker on the team who may be able to help getting extra help at home, uh, may provide resources for Ms. S, including the potential that she might be able to be paid for some of the time she spends as a care provider, and that may allow her to find a better balance in, in work, may provide, help her find connection to other resources, and then certainly uh, counseling, which can involve a chaplain or can involve other types of counselors. Uh, to make sure that we talk to Miss S uh, about both sides of her experience. So help her with her grief and her struggle and her burnout. And also uh, see if there are ways that we can find joy and meaning and connection in her life and kind of reinvigorate her uh, by talking about how meaningful it is that she is able to be um, and has the um, you know, ability to spend this time with her mother and has the ability to give back to her mother for all her mother gave to her. Uh, for case two, uh, Mr. R, a gentleman with Parkinson's, has pain and, and is depressed. And so again, if we're thinking about the total pain of serious illness, uh, there's the physical pain. 
And so part of this may be finding the cause of his pain. Uh, in Parkinson's disease, sometimes that can involve um, uh, orthopedic problems. Maybe he has a frozen shoulder and there are stretches or physical therapies that can be done. Um, sometimes it involves muscle tension and Botox or changes in medications can help. Uh, sometimes we use pain medications to treat pain or to allow people to be more functional. Uh, but pain also carries with it uh, emotional consequences uh, that people who live in pain have a constant reminder of their Parkinson's. They feel out of control. And so we can work with a psychologist or chaplain on our team to find ways of dealing with the emotional and psychological aspects of pain, um, as well as to use um, different methods for working with that pain. Uh, for example, deep breathing or meditation. Um, we can explore the depression. Uh, is that really psychiatric depression? Is it grief? Is it sadness? Is it anger? Um, and, and at the same time, and I think this is very important part of my work and part of the palliative care package, is, is explore, um, are there opportunities, even with pain, even with Parkinson's, for finding joy, for finding connection, and for finding meaning? And so we want to make sure that we address uh, both sides of the equation of quality of life. So there's part of it is zero to negative 10, and that's pain and depression uh, and feeling demoralized and also zero to positive 10. Uh, because despite Parkinson's, and I think Kermit's story uh, really highlights this, uh, there is still life after the diagnosis. And, and we need to work together as a team uh, to find that life, to grab it and to hang on to it. Um, so I know we're a little bit over time. Uh, Try to keep my comments short, and I thank you for my for your attention. Uh, also, I guess one last thing to note um, is that the team here at Columbia and the team at the Parkinson's Foundation nationally is working to make palliative care a standard, integrated part of of, of care for everybody with Parkinson's. And so, I think you are going to be hearing more and hopefully receiving more care with this philosophy and this approach. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kluger, for your thoughtful comments and perspective. I know um, your words were really well received by me. I think um, I just want to repeat the what you said about finding joy, meaning, and connection, um, despite and in spite of Parkinson's disease. So we are running a little over, but I hope the participants will forgive me if I say that maybe we'll skip the great break. We can't see you, so feel free to get up, stretch your legs as we listen to the rest of the speakers. But um, I just don't want us to miss any time and this great knowledge we're getting. Um, so I'd like to invite Ms. Genick to share her thoughts. I know that nutrition um, is one of the number one questions I get asked all the time. What should I be eating or preparing for my loved one who has Parkinson's? Okay, thank you so much for having me. My name is Shoshana Genack and I am a nutritionist, an outpatient nutritionist at New York Presbyterian. So I guess there can be a bunch of different concerns or questions regarding nutrition that someone might have if they have Parkinson's disease or their loved one has Parkinson's disease. Um, I think one of the number one concerns might be constipation, and that will be our first case that we'll look at in a minute. But other concerns can be weight loss or poor appetite due to uh, possible depression or just disinterest in food, uh, decreased sense of smell or taste, making people not interested in food. There also might be, um, due to tremors, people might have a harder time cutting food or um, holding a cup. So there might be many different concerns that people can't get adequate nutrition or enough nutrients and they're just not sure what to do. So it will be individualized, you know, based on what your concern is, but let's look at some of these cases and try to address uh, main concerns or the biggest concerns. So in case number one, um, Mr. B notices he has a bowel movement every other day. He's trying to drink water. He's trying to take Marilax and he's making smoothies, um, but it is time consuming and it is hard to chop the vegetables. So addressing constipation and also trouble maybe cutting or uh, using the knife. So what can we do to manage constipation? There are many ideas and um, I'm sure people have tried different ideas, but in terms of just smoothies, smoothies can be a great way to get nutrition in, especially if someone's not interested in eating. Uh, drinking liquid, high calorie liquids could be very helpful. And now on the market, there are a lot of 
definitely frozen fruit and frozen vegetables so that you can just put that into a smoothie and not have to chop. But there's also even bags of pre-made smoothies or you know, a smoothie blend. So Dole, which is a popular brand, you can buy a smoothie blend from Dole and just add some milk or Greek yogurt or juice to make it a fairly high calorie, high protein smoothie without requiring any chopping of vegetables. If you're going to make a smoothie, which can be a good idea, you can also add something like flaxseed or chia seeds, um, some nut butter, some dates to get extra calories in that way. Um, dried fruit is another good source of fiber. And some people like to start their day with some apricots or some dates, and maybe some nuts or peanut butter on the side. And that's another good source of fiber. There are also some really high calorie cereals. Kashi, K-A-S-H-I is a popular brand and they make a large variety of cereals. Um, there's another cereal that has a funny name. It's called Poop Like a Champion. And I don't know that it tastes the best, but it it's supposed to have very good results. So some people really like that high fiber cereal. And of course, oatmeal is high in fiber and you can add flaxseed or chia seed or wheat germ to oatmeal to even increase the fiber further as well as berries to increase the fiber further in your cereal. You can also have yogurt and again, add flaxseed or chia seed or berries or granola to the yogurt. Another thing people try for um, if they're having trouble with regular bowel movements is they make a mixture of applesauce and prune juice and wheat bran or oat bran. They do one cup of each and they mix it together and then they have one tablespoon or one to two tablespoons every night. And that can help with constipation as well. Again, depending on what you like to eat or um, how well you're able to chew and swallow foods, there's a lot, there are a lot of high fiber snacks out there that are becoming more popular. There are um, bars, high fiber bars, like Kind Bars and Chia Bars. There are um, bean snacks that are popular now and chickpea snacks. You can also make roasted chickpeas, but they're really a uh, popcorn. There are a lot of high fiber snacks that you can find and you can have them between meals. Um, another thing that we want to remember on top of fiber, on top of trying to increase our fiber is that you want to drink a lot of fluid. You want to make sure you're getting a lot of fluid um, during your day because fluid is going to be very important to stay regular. And you want to aim for maybe eight to 10, at least eight to 10 cups a day and try to keep fluid or try to keep a water bottle, a reusable water bottle with you if you're watching TV or if you're on the go to remember to drink. And then a third important thing is going to be um, moving or exercise, even marching in place, doing yoga at home, but exercise really can be important for constipation. You really don't wanna just sit, but if you can move, that's very helpful. Um, in terms of the second case, which I don't, I think I'll say as much, but in terms of the second case, the question is somebody who is, um, has early satiety and they are getting full very quickly. And they also don't have, they lost their sense of smell. So what can they do? So for early satiety, what we try to recommend is small, small, frequent meals. So small meals, but more frequently. So let's say aiming to have four to six meals a day, opposed to two to three larger meals a day. Think of them more as you know, you can think of them as large snacks, not meals, but trying to eat something four to six times a day, trying to have your liquids in between. Um, so trying to get full on solids during the meal and having liquids in between. And when you do have your liquids, trying to make them higher calorie can be helpful. Um, one idea I saw is to take a supplement like Ensure Clear and to freeze it in ice cube trays, uh, an ice cube tray, and then just to pop one of those cubes into whatever you're drinking just to get more calories that way. Um, if somebody is having a hard time with a uh, smell and they, they have a decreased sense of smell, having, using a lot of herbs and seasoning, especially very, uh, ar aromatic seasonings like curry or rosemary or saffron can be very helpful to use, um, sauces, to use mustard, barbecue sauce, to make sure you get a lot of, um, so you can taste it and to, not have food too cold because if something's a little bit warmer, you smell it better and then hopefully you could taste it better as well. So those are some suggestions in terms of both early satiety to have your small but frequent meals, high calorie foods when you're eating like avocado, nuts, peanut butter, eggs, seeds, like I mentioned before, flaxseed, chia seed, peanut butter, 
and trying to have more seasoning, spices, sauces added to your food. That's so um, helpful. Um, those suggestions. Shoshana, there was a question in the chat mm -hmm. that smoothies have a lot of sugar. What about Parkinson's disease patients who are also a diabetic? Any okay. thoughts? Yes. Yeah, so smoothies, the smoothies I mentioned have a, could have a lot of fruit. So it's going to be natural sugar. So again, I do think it's going to be different if someone's just trying to watch added sugar versus somebody with diabetes. But for somebody with diabetes, we typically try to recommend more of a green juice, which would be mostly uh, spinach, kale, celery. And then I usually recommend one portion of fruit, like an apple or a pineapple to, or mango, just to get something sweet in there. And then of course you could do seeds and um, nuts to add the uh, protein or some plain Greek yogurt for protein. Awesome, super helpful. And just to let the participants know, we do have um, a couple of sheets of a handout that um, Shoshana helped, that pre she prepared and shared with us about some of these tips for nutrition. Um, so you should be able to find that in the packet that you can download from the Eventbrite. So we'll keep going. So I just wanted to give a quick overview on non-motor symptoms from a neurologist perspective. So, you know, Parkinson's, as I was saying, is a very complex disease that seems to affect all aspects of our life. And I think this is a sort of blurry, but nice visual that shares the, the fact that from really head to toe, um, you could experience symptoms. And so often when I'm seeing a patient, that's how I think about it. And I try to go from head to toe. So just to, so that people are aware and recognize that some of these symptoms may be part of Parkinson's is sleep disorders are a big part of Parkinson's disease people can have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep. We call it interrupted or fragmented sleep. People can experience excessive daytime sleepiness. There are sleep disorders that are part of Parkinson's. One is called REM sleep behavior disorder. So we know our REM sleep is typically when we dream. Usually we're paralyzed, but people with Parkinson's because of this um, abnormality of the levels of dopamine tend to talk or yell or act out their dreams. They punch or kick. And that can cause injuries to their bed partner or could lead injuries to themselves. They could fall out of bed or hit their head. And so though the sleep disturbance is itself not dangerous or sinister, it can lead to injury, which is why we want to recognize it. Um, sometimes because of the stiffness and slowness, people will have trouble um, with cramping at night or difficulty turning over in bed. And then if they wake up at night to go to the bathroom and they are not haven't taken their medications, they might find that they're shuffling or very slow. So these are all issues if you're experiencing them or as a care partner recognize that the person with Parkinson's has these symptoms, it's important men to mention to the neurologist because there's many different options to address these. Um, people can experience behavioral and mood symptoms. And we've heard about this a little bit, but I just wanted to emphasize apathy is a really challenging symptom. And apathy is different than depression, where apathy I think of as a as kind of someone becoming less um, able to initiate activities, less able to engage maybe. So I know that I've heard my patients describe that their family member now has become a wallflower or they used to be really jubilant and at the dinner table participating and now they're just very quiet. And why is that they seem depressed? And yet when you ask the person, you know, are you sad or feeling down? And they say, no, I'm fine. I'm just you know, not participating. And this can often affect the care partner and family more than it affects the person. So it's important to recognize. And apathy, as Lori was pointing out, is hard to treat. There's not medications that help, but creating a routine can be helpful. So, you know, let's do a walk every day. So that individual may have previously been interested in saying, let's do this activity, let's do that activity. And now they're more of a someone that follows along with the crowd. And, and that may just be a change in them. Some people can also experience hallucinations and these can be a part of Parkinson's at later stages or it can be from the medication. So it's important if you recognize these symptoms, again, to tell the doctor so that your medicines if needed can be adjusted. Another tricky symptom is lightheadedness or dizziness. And this can be from something called orthostatic hypotension. What it means is when you stand up, the blood pressure drops. And when your blood pressure is low, it makes you feel kind of foggy or dizzy. And again, this can be part of Parkinson's or a side effect from medication. A few other 
tricky symptoms. One is fatigue. And fatigue is, again, one of these tough symptoms to treat. It can be because of the Parkinson's itself and stiffness of the muscles. It can be from not moving. Sitting all day can make you feel even more tired. Um, so exercise can help. It can be from depression that people feel fatigued. It could also be um, from pain or other symptoms, maybe not sleeping well at night. So if you're experiencing fatigue, again, it's like a little bit of detective work that the doctor can do with you to try to figure out what's the cause of the fatigue and what can be done for it. Excess sweating. So this is another tough symptom that people sometimes sweat through their clothes at night. Um, it can be from the medicines wearing off, or it can be part of the disease itself. And we usually recommend, you know, thin cotton shirts, a cool room, sleeping with the fan. Um, some people get skin changes, a shiny forehead or, or like scaly skin. And Selsun Blue or other types of shampoo for dandruff can be really effective just while you're washing the hair. You do a little wash of the face as well. Sexual dysfunction, I think, is an often, unfortunately, um, topic that's not discussed. You know, I think because of the lack of movement, people have difficulty engaging in sexual activity, which is an important part of one's health and wellness. Um, so there are some strategies that we can offer because the gut slows down, sometimes medicines like Viagra or similar medicines can be used, but it's important to know that they might take longer to be effective. Um, Things, simple things like using silk sheets or making sure that the medicines are working so that you're on when you want to engage in this kind of activity. Unfortunately, it's not as um, spontaneous maybe as one would hope, but it's important that if this is a problem um, that it's discussed. And I know it's sometimes something that may feel uncomfortable to discuss with your doctor, but um, I think it's really important to make sure that um, hopefully your provider's asking you about this, but if they're not, to mention it as well. Urinary symptoms of urgency, frequency, and incontinence can also be part of Parkinson's. So sometimes a urologist can evaluate because it's sometimes hard to know, is this from Parkinson's or from prostatic issues, you know, as we're aging. Vision problems. Um, people have trouble because the eyes don't come together and that makes it hard to read up close. So sometimes using prisms or other strategies can help. But again, we don't have enough time, unfortunately, during this training, but to explain all of the potential solutions. But I want you to be aware that there are strategies we can do to address all of these different symptoms as you may not realize this is part of Parkinson's. So with that, um, I'd like to invite Ms. Picardo and Dr. McPherson so that we can have a conversation for maybe the next 10 to 15, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if we can keep it to that so we have enough time for our care partners um, to just review some strategies that we can use to be an empowered care partner. And I'd like to let Ms. Picardo and Dr. McPherson take the lead. I'm going to <laughs> go, you can go ahead, Angela. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And I want to welcome um, all of you attending this workshop and learn about Parkinson's disease. I, we have a very good information last night and today but um, I want to give you the point of view of a caregiver. I am a caregiver. And there is no school or resources or place that we can go to learn to be a good caregiver. It is a role that we didn't choose to have in our life, but we're facing now that. It was hard in the beginning when you, you become a caregiver. Of course, it was hard. Nobody know what a caregiver feels. Just we know how hard it could be and how difficult it is for us because becoming a caregiver is going to affect us emotionally, in, mentally, socially, spiritual, economically, and physically like our loss was without diagnosis. And even we have to face all that situation in our life, we have to be sure 
that we are not going to be change who, who we are before a diagnosis of our loved one. Um, I'd like to share with you one of the tips that helped me in my role of caregiver, that the, the first things about it is learn about the disease, the knowledge about it. Because when you have the knowledge, you are going to have the strategies to solve problems, problems that you are going to face every single day. Because you have to take your role like, or like as caregiver day by day. Don't stress too much thinking about the future. Just working day by day. And one of the strategies when you know about the disease is that it's going to help you to be realistic and honestly with you, with yourself like a caregiver to communicate and say, I'm, I'm capable to do this and I cannot de do this part of, the, of my work because we are not heroes, we are human beings and our loved one, our partner with the disease, our family members, our family, our loved one providers and even our own providers have to identify that we, we have the right to have the weakness that we don't know how to manage the situation to be a caregiver. So be realistic in your abilities and honestly share that is going to give you the support that you are going to need because people around you is going to know that you are asking for help. If you, if you have a hobby in your life before becoming a caregiver, please continue with your hobby. Be sure that you continue uh, spread the knowledge about this new reality in your families, with members of the family, with your community, with members in your church, with your coworkers, like in the video we saw just we watched yesterday, the person who has the Parkinson's disease, she has to feel comfortable and don't break out to share the new diagnosis with your coworkers at work. It's the same for us. For us, like caregivers. We need to be sure after we pass the, the shock of the situation, the grief that we are living in since the moment we become a caregiver, put ourselves together and share that. Oh, you know, I am a caregiver. And this is the abilities that I will develop. From, I develop from now on, and this is what can I do, and this is what I cannot do. Something that helped a lot is be organized. That is a word that is was telling since last night and everybody's said about it because when we are organized, we have a peace of mind and help us to target what is our daily routine to support our loved one and support ourselves. So please, you always keep a notebook. <laughs> Wherever you go, you keep a notebook where you are going to have the names and the email address and the easy way to contact your provider, your loved one provider, even your provider. I used to have the first part of the notebook for my loved one. And in the back of the notebook is for me, for my own provider, for my own resources, because I have to think of me. So this is my loved one and I'm here in the same notebook. So when you go to see providers for your checkup, you will share, how do you feel physically? How do you feel emotionally and mentally. Don't forget about your mental health. But sometimes it's a taboo, especially for some cultures, but we have to be honest with ourselves. And something that even you have a calendar, try to have a big calendar. You have a link in this presentation that you can have a digital calendar or print a calendar. I have a print calendar. And this is some, a tool that I love it because it's a <laughs> four ink. You see four different colors. So in my calendar, because I always in a rush and caregivers know what I'm talking about. I just turn in my on the refrigerator, on the desk, in my bedroom. And I know the red for me is the most important. Then it's the blue, the green, and the black. The green for me is my fun time. I always looking for the green link in that month. That is my time. Try to look for respite. It is hard. I know it's hard to find a person who will provide care for our loved ones. Even if you have the money to pay for it, 
you don't find easily raised big person to work with with your loved one. It is something that is so important to educate the community. Try to be part of um, groups, support groups. There are not a lot of support groups, but you have all these providers in this presentation. Go back to your providers. Ask them where are the support groups? And if there are no support groups where you live, you start one. Tell your providers, I like to meet other, other caregivers. I want to share my feeling. I want to be in a safe environment where I could feel free to talk and learn about how are, what are the strategies. And the providers who are listening to this presentation, I like to take the, uh, take in, keep you in mind the cultural and linguistic part of the caregiver, not just the client, the person with the, the disease, but also the caregiver, because we immigrants, we are scared in a new place, in a place where it's not culture, it's not our language, and we're learning and we try our best to provide the right care for our loved one and be the right advocate and connect providers. When you have your notebook, even uh, sometimes we don't have the providers working in the same hospital, they're coming from different centers because we have to go to different um, therapies and specialists. So it's good you, when you have this and ask your providers, can you email, can my, I'm going to see my physical therapy, my physical therapy or the physical therapy, my loved one can email you. So you both can talk about it. So we all are on the same page and we all are going to support my loved one to live happily and continue their life. Be sure that the disease or a role of caregiver never define us. Never, never. We, we deserve to be happy. We deserve the support to continue our journey, but we have to communicate about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Picardo. I think that you captured so many of the key points and messages that our care partners need to know. Um, Chelsea, did you want to add anything? Um, I would just also say too, it's, uh, it's important to also listen to the individual uh, with Parkinson's. And so I can't stress this enough that it's, it's so, so important to have your eyes open, your ears open, um, and to really have a conversation about um, what are their goals. I know that um, Dr. Quinn and I have been uh, really sort of pushing that forward of that, uh, that listening piece. And so it's really important because this is a big adjustment. And, um, you know, I think that in America, we tend to pride ourselves on our independence and having that independence, uh, or having it be threatened in a way, uh, to get it, to have it go away, um, is a big challenge for a lot of people. And it can be very difficult to ask a caregiver for help. And so having that, uh, having that open dialogue and making sure that you're accessible and asking those questions and um, having that communication there, I think is extremely important. So that's just sort of what I wanted to add, but I think uh, Ms. Picardo, you did such a wonderful job um, going through that list. And it's, it's such an honor to be able to even be here with you, so. <laughs> Um, so we do have a nice document that Ms. Picardo put together for all of the care partners and participants that's in your packet that really goes through all of these eight components of what it is to be an empowered care partner so that you can go back to that and reference it. But one other thing that I'm just reminded of along with the notebook to highlight as Elizabeth said that you know be sure that you have your questions answered by your providers. So if you need to ask that question once, twice, three times, say, I still didn't quite get it. Can you explain it in a different way? And to get it in writing and write it down because there's so much information and the emotional, you might be nervous, you know, when you're in front of your, your provider, maybe it makes you anxious and you feel like you can't interrupt them or you don't want to ask too many questions. So just be sure that you feel empowered that this is your time. This is your consultation and you're there to get the information and skills you need so that you can provide the best care you can and so that the person with Parkinson's gets the care they need. And so with that, we'll just kind of transition to include um, these tips for communicating, which we kind of reviewed already, but transition to um, 
include Mr. Coley, Ms. Denise Coley, and Ms. Hay, um, and just get their take. And, and I'd invite Ms. Picardo and Chelsea to stay in on this conversation, and we can have a discussion until we kind of close out today's session. You know, time is really flying. But I'd love to hear from the Coleys and Ms. Hay, as well as Mr. Smith, if he wanted to participate. Um, you know, how do you prepare for a doctor visits or how do you prepare for these sessions with PT, OT or other allied healthcare professionals? Um, and what are some of the strategies that you employ to create this care team that's really there to support you? So I'll go first as a patient. Um, the way I prepare for a doctor's visit is I make a list and prioritize my questions and concerns for the uh, meeting. And I take any information that I need prior uh, to the doctor's appointment. And I'm open and honest about what's really going on, what's noticed or changed since last visit. I used to always say, everything's okay, okay, okay. But sometimes mm -hmm. days it is not okay. So you say today is not okay. Uh, I always have a list of medications. Sometimes I have my wear and care kit. Otherwise I always have it in my phone and my SOS on my phone. Uh, Can you I, say what the SOS is? Because maybe some folks don't know. So SOS on, uh, on iPhone, I'm sure it's the same on the PC is where you put all your emergency numbers. But with my emergency numbers, I have my doctors, my Parkinson's uh, disease in there and all medications. So if I were unconscious and had to go to the doctor or to the hospital, they could switch onto my SOS and get all the information to hand right away. Because I always have a phone on me at all times. So Thank you. Great. you're welcome. Um, I keep a log of any symptoms, any changes, I absolutely have a requirement that Bernard is at all doctor's visits because he hears things that I don't and vice versa. Uh, I have to be mindful to keep my doctor up to date and that I'll talk a little bit about the care teams so you know why that's so important. And then uh, bringing lab tests and discussing research study participation, which is really important because I do a lot of research studies. I do a lot of wearables. I do a lot of uh, different kinds of research that are non-invasive. Now that really plays into the care team. When I first got diagnosed, everybody said, well, we had to sit down and figure out what to do. So Bernard and I sat down and looked. And what I'm telling uh, as my care team is my initial care team. It grows and changes over time. And mine has changed a little bit. So I developed a care plan with uh, Bernard. Then we talked to the doctors about it and the family. And then what kind of support did uh, I need and he needed as we moved through the stages? And being very frank, I had to think about Bernard coming saying, well, what's important to you? So I had to think about it. The most important thing, and he'll laugh, is staying as independent as possible uh, and making sure that I have as much control as possible and that I can continue to do the things that I enjoy. Those were my three main objectives. And then my first team was my neurologist or MDS, my general practitioner, which is the person who really uh, handles the whole group because I had a big group before, my OBGYN, my dentist, my cardiologist, my optometrist, my holistic doctor, my acupuncture, uh, my myofascial release therapist, and then rock steady boxing and Tai Chi. And you might say that's a very big list and it's a little bit unique from what you normally see, but your dental works with your gut which causes dental issues. And a lot of people talk about the dental issues. Um, the optometrist is really important because sometimes you can tell that something's wrong ahead of time. And I had that perception problem. And then the holistic doctor was to give me a different viewpoint of Eastern and Western medicine, because I'm really big on that. I had been going to acupuncture since the days of my marathons and my three day walks. And it really helps me with my pain and my stress. And myofascia was something new that she could work on me and get some of the stiffness out of the way. And then of course I have to have my exercise pieces. So rock steady boxing does the combination and the Tai Chi helps me with my balance. So my list is probably a little bit different from everything that everybody else has said, but it's what I started off with. I might've swapped out one or two people, uh, but every time I swap out some people, I add some other people in, but that's the core from what I started on. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Ms. Hay, do you want to kind of speak to, you know, being a long distance caregiver? Like how do you, how are you involved in doctor's visits or other sessions of your mom's care? Yeah, in my case, it's very, very different. 
because I'm the one making the appointment. And well, we were in the middle of the pandemic. So um, lately my mom's appointments with her movement disorder doctor have been uh, virtual. And so I, I, I'm, I have to set those up and tell them the symptoms because sometimes her speech is, it's kind of hard for her. So, you know, they will meet with her and then speak with me. <laughs> and then I have to translate that to the caregiver <laughs> or if there are any changes or anything like that. It's kind of hard because I don't get to see the changes in her and the caregivers aren't always um, as mindful as maybe I would be with my mom to say, oh, well, I noticed this. Maybe when they notice it, it's probably really more severe. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a little different. Um, like yesterday, she had uh, cataract glaucoma surgery and today was her follow-up visit. And um, there were a lot of disasters with transportation and all that kind of thing. And so <laughs> I'm in the middle of my own doctor's appointment and I'm getting frantic calls. <laughs> To please help us, we you know the caregiver is just as helpless. <laughs> She's kind of a little frantic, and and I'm in the middle of my appointment for myself, and so I'm always in the middle of that kind of stuff. But um, so my preparation is different. And thank you so much, Miss Picardo, because I have papers, little pieces of paper, everywhere in the house. I have them in the kitchen, all over, and I need to have a book because I was on the phone this morning about her medication. And I was like, I know it's on a piece of paper somewhere upstairs. And I know. So when I get the calls, I don't uh, grab for that book. I say, oh, let me just grab the quickest thing I can write on and I'll, I'll transfer it later and later never comes. So thank you for that idea. I'm going to get the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think you speak to some of the challenges of needing to be organized and available at a moment's notice. Um, given that you're kind of at a distance and not there all the time. Um, Mr. Coley or Mr. Smith, did you want to add to your perspective in terms of preparation and advance of visits? I'll let Mr. Smith talk since he represents uh, almost solo, right, Mr. Smith? Yes, I do. But I tell you the truth, um, Mr. Coley, I, I don't know if I want to marry you or marry your wife. <laughs> you two represent such a beautiful, beautiful picture and it's such a cohesive way of handling Parkinson's. I truly, truly admire both of you. I mean, I thought I, I thought I had a list of things to do or different things to take, different supplements to take. I have to talk to your wife. I mean, she, <laughs> she swaps. She swamps me, and you <laughs> yesterday listening to you speak about what you do in your preparation. I mean, I have a lot to learn. I have a lot to learn. And that's the beautiful thing about it, you know. I remain teachable. And I'm gonna make sure that I stay in contact with you both and continue to learn because um, life is beautiful. I see every, every day as a beautiful gift from God. I have so many, I have so much respect for all of the people on the panel, for all the work that they're doing, trying to help out the people who, are, who have Parkinson's, the people that take care of people that have Parkinson's. I know for a fact because I took care of my mother for nine and a half years. She's a double amputee. She, she had diabetes and she was on dialysis. Dialysis. And I took care of her. I moved in with her to take care of her. So I know what it is to be a caregiver. It's a very difficult job. But I learned how to do it with love and I have so much respect for the people like Lorraine Hay. I mean, you, you do this with love and you do it long distance. And you, there's so much to be respected for, for the work that you do. And I'm blessed. I'm blessed to meet all of you. Dr. Shaw, I can't thank you enough. <laughs> Well, I think that that's a great transition to the next topic, but 
if if anyone has more to add about that, and I didn't pay Mr. Smith to say that, but you know, I think he highlights the importance of having a circle of friends or a support network. I think even this dynamic that you've observed among the panelists, and I didn't explain it before, and Ms. Parker mentioned it, but we've created a small group called the PD Movers. Uh, it's people that are of African-American or Black background who have Parkinson's disease, and many of them met someone else who was like them for the first time. And I think this sense of kinship and oneness and connection that was created that's even being you know, expressed right now speaks to how as you're going through a challenge like having Parkinson's or being a care partner, that really having a support network or a circle of friends, a person you can call in the middle of the night is so valuable. So I'd like to invite the panelists to share, how did you create a circle of friends? You know, I think a lot of people are embarrassed or reluctant to share their diagnosis or the diagnosis that their loved ones has. So it can be hard to develop that support team. So Mr. Coley, I, I see your um, no, thinking. I, yes. I see the wheels turning. So please share with us. So, so let me say this. Um, I, I, I want to make an important point first to both the, the people with Parkinson's and the care partners. Your circle of, of support may not be the people that you that you had at the moment you got the diagnosis and i want to emphasize that many of the people who are now our support team are are people we met after the diagnosis and here's why we know that many of our um, our colleagues are hesitant to disclose a that, that they have parkinson's or to address uh their disability but there's nothing like being in a group of people who are like you to open you up. And we had huge aha moments when we got actively engaged in, for example, the Learning Institute at uh, Becoming Research Advocates uh, with the Parkinson's Foundation. Or we went to a, uh, a seminar with a room with a thousand people in the room with Michael J. Fox. And all of a sudden you're surrounded by a thousand people who are like you or experiencing the similar thing and people you could talk to. So you don't have to fear anymore that you're talking to people who don't get it, won't understand, etc. And we learned firsthand the real value of seeing someone who's like you or in the same position you're in. So what I want to encourage you to do, uh, it's been said several times, but let me emphasize it, get out amongst those who have Parkinson's disease get out to events for that are put on by the various Parkinson's disease associations and foundations, because there you will meet people who do understand, who can relate to the things that you're feeling, experiencing, talk about, etc., and tell you their stories. And all of a sudden, you realize no matter how much you thought you were alone or thought you were by yourself. You're not. There are many. And so, and finally, I'll put a, a, a period on that by, by saying that uh, uh, Dr. Hyrall uh, mentioned uh, PD movers. But let me tell you, not just at PD movers, but in similar groups that we've become associated with, probably the number one thing we heard from people from the communities of color is that until they got into those groups, they had never seen anybody that looked like, like that. And it was a big relief to finally see somebody who looked like, like you or from the same kind of neighborhood you came from or, or experienced the same kind of things you did or went to the same kind of churches you went to or whatever, but somebody who was like you and how much of a help that is mentally, et cetera, uh, for dealing with Parkinson's. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and becoming a care partner. So important. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And, you know, I, I'm just mindful of the time that it's eight o'clock. Time seems to really fly. So um, I'm really thankful for everyone's participation, sticking with us, uh, even without a break. 
but more to come tomorrow. Just to let you know, tomorrow is really focused on the third part of living and thriving with Parkinson's disease, which is how to overcome challenges to accessing resources, talking about what compassionate and personalized care looks like for an individual with PD, and a session on care partner needs. We're gonna have some time for case discussions and some small group feedback sessions. So if we have more cases to discuss, but you know, we welcome your feedback. So if you have any comments to share with us between now and tomorrow, but if not, um, I'd just like to thank you all again for staying with us and um, say good night and see you tomorrow. Thanks everyone.